we have, my, my goal is two more messages on Colossians. <laughs> That might change. Uh, flip over to Colossians chapter 4 with me, if you would, please. Um, we are still working on our uh, unsung heroes. So we are in Colossians chapter 4. And I'm going to start in verse 7, and, and I'm going to read uh, through for a bit. But I want to, you know, we covered part of this last week. So we're in Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Paul is wrapping up his letter to the church at Colossae. Um, it's a sister letter to uh, a letter that was written to Laodicea, the church at Laodicea, and we'll see reference to that. It's also written at the same time as the letter to Philemon. And we are going through the list of people that Paul is, he's kind of just letting everybody know how the crowd that's with him is doing. And so we're going to wrap this up here in just a minute. So he says in verse 7, Typicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Here being Rome. This time, uh, Paul is in Rome. He is being imprisoned. Uh, at some point hereafter, he will actually get to share the gospel, we believe, with Caesar. Okay, that was the prophecy spoken over it. So in verse 10 he says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instruction. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Uh, Epaphras, or Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers of Laodicea and to Nympha and the brothers in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Now, we this week and last week I've called the unsung heroes. Because, you know, we're very familiar with Paul and with Peter and with John. And we, we hear these names and and everybody can kind of make some kind of association from Scripture with them. But we need to understand that the early church wasn't founded and established by just these three men. They had co-workers. They had men that were going with them. And last week we talked about Tychicus and Onesimus and Aristarchus and Mark. And that's as far as we got. And this week we're going to try and get through the rest of them. And... Uh, I want to share a little bit because there's, there's some interesting people in what, what uh, Paul is writing here. He says uh, in verse 11, he says, And Jesus, who is called Justice. Justice. Now that's not justice like justice as in you got justice when that person did you wrong. That's not what he's talking about. Although the Latin actually carries with it the same idea. Uh, this actually was a very common name for Jews to take upon themselves, to be appended to them. Uh, the, the Jewish word is actually tidlik, and it means righteous. Okay? Um, we actually see this referenced in uh, Acts chapter 1. Uh, flip over there with me if you would real quick. I just want to draw a correlation here. Uh, if you remember in Acts chapter 1, um, the church had gathered together, the apostles had gathered together to look to replace Judas, the one who had fallen. And they're trying to determine who is supposed to be uh, in this place. And in verse 23 we see, uh, and they put forward two, 
two men that they felt met these requirements. Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. Okay. Now, this, this Justice is not the same Justice we're talking about, but we see that this is, is a fairly common name that, that are, it's appended. It's kind of like, um, let's see, uh, I believe the email address is Mom the Bomb. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, it's the bomb is a title that is appended to Mom, so that people will be able to identify her as compared to all the other moms, right, Kathy? <laughs> I don't know. She was the one. I don't know. Um, but it, but it's a it's a title that's appended, okay? And in the Latin it means justice, but in or just, and in the the Hebrew typically it means righteous. So what we see here, back in Colossians, we see and Jesus who is called justice. And I think they specify that so there's no longer any confusion about this is not the same Jesus that went to the cross, died and was resurrected because he ascended. He's not here anymore. This is Jesus who's called justice. Um, now he says something interesting here. He says, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. Now, what does that mean? It's kind of obvious in some way, but maybe not so much in others. What does he mean? These, these men, he says, Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus called Justice, are the only men of the circumcision. What does that mean? Jews, yeah, they're fellow Jews. They're, or, or, or completed Jews. They're Jews who have received the Messiah. Okay? These are the only ones that are with me. If you know a little bit about the history of Paul, you know that Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? As a matter of fact, at one point, he is uh, ministering, and he's ministering to the Jews, and they reject him, they reject his message. Um, you got to wonder about Paul a little bit. I scratched my head a little bit. Uh, we were having a, a little bit of a discussion on Thursday in the brothers' meeting, and we were talking about uh, Paul at Lystra, and, you know, Paul and Barnabas go to Lystra on the first missionary journey, and, and they're sharing the gospel, and a lot of people are, are, are believers, are coming to believe. And then, then some people from some other towns follow them, 150 miles by foot. They follow them, and they start convincing people, no, this guy's a lunatic. And, and not only is he a lunatic, he's a danger. And they haul Paul out of the city gates, and they take him out, and they stone him. Why Paul and not Barnabas? Well, I think there's something to be said, because in that story, remember, that's where they come up to the people, and they say, oh, the gods are among us. There's Zeus and there's Hermes. And they called Barnabas Zeus, and they called Paul Hermes. Why did they call Paul Hermes? Remember the, the passage in Acts? Because he's the one that did all the talking. <laughs> Barnabas was probably more of an encouragement, more of a support. But Paul did all the talking. And I think that's what made him the target. Paul wouldn't shut up. That's not a bad thing, if you don't mind people heaving rocks at your head. That's a good thing. But Paul was the one, he had it rough. I mean, he goes to Jerusalem, he's introduced to the other apostles. And what happens? He goes out and starts ministering, and there's death threats. We gotta, we gotta get the dude out of the city. We get him. Let's send him elsewhere for safety's sake. But at one point, Paul gets fed up with trying to minister to the Jews, and he even tells him, he says, "Your blood is on your own head. You have received unto yourself what you're asking for. Your blood is on your head. The word has come to you. You've rejected it. I am no longer ministering to you." I am going to go and I'm going to minister to the Gentiles. Now, what's amazing about this, to me, is the Gentiles didn't really receive him any better than the Jews did. They beat him, they scourged him, they did all kinds of things to him. But this was the niche that God had called Paul to. Now, in this, we see Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus called Justice are Jews as well. And they come with him. Now, do you know that Paul never considered himself anything but a Jew? 
Do, do you understand that? He believed himself to have received the promise given to the Jews. Okay? So, as far as Paul was concerned, he was the recipient of the fulfillment of Scripture. That was given first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. So he didn't go and all of a sudden consider himself, well, I'm no longer a Jew. Well, that would be to him like us saying we're no longer human. He was still Jewish. And you've got to wonder how much it grieved his heart that his own people didn't receive what God had promised him. They didn't even understand that it had come. They didn't understand the damage that they had done in rejecting that. But we see that these five men are with him. Now, this is why it's so important to understand, why I've kind of given you all this backstory, because this next line that he says, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Okay? They've been a comfort to me. These are men with the same backgrounds, the same upbringing, the same scripture, the same culture, the same heritage. These are men that he can talk to about things that you and I really don't get. Why is it so important to know what tribe you're from? I mean, I don't have a tribe. We, you know, we kind of got a clan, the band notes, but we don't have a tribe. But... You know, but they would understand that. And they could understand when he was talking to them and he was talking the fulfillment of scriptures, they immediately knew what those scriptures were. The Gentiles did not. Paul had to take an entirely different approach with the Gentiles because they didn't have the Old Testament. They never read, that wasn't given to them. That was given to the Jews. Okay? So rather than take the Old Testament and try and teach the entire Old Testament to the Gentiles and then show them how that was fulfilled. Paul had to take an entirely different tact. As a matter of fact, this is part of the Judaizer thing that we talk about. Uh, we see in several of Paul's writings. We see in the book of Acts. The Judaizers were those Jews who thought that Jesus was kind of the answer, but he was the answer in that he brought the Gentiles to Judaism. And so when a, a town received the gospel from Paul or Barnabas or one of the other apostles, the, the Judaizers would come in right behind him and say, Yes, but there's some other things you need to be aware of. First, snippy, snippy. You got to get snipped. In order to be right, to be a good, I don't even know what they call them, Nazarene sect Jew, you got to fulfill the law of Moses as well. And we see, as a matter of fact, Paul has some harsh words to say about that in uh, Galatians chapter 5. He tells them, he said, I wish that they would go the whole way. Not just get circumcised, but he said, I wish they'd get emasculated. If you're going to do it, do the whole thing. He has no patience for the Judaizers. Okay? But these Jews that are with him, they've received the promise and they understand. Okay? But now he goes into the list of the Gentiles. Okay? And these are people that did not have the Old Testament, but they have faith unto righteousness. And we see um, Epaphras. Now we've talked about Epaphras before because he started off, he came with Paul. He was actually uh, commended by Paul in chapter 1. We've done a message on that. I think that was back in 2011. <laughs> Feel free to go back and look at it. They're all numbered. Josh does a really good job of keeping those up on, on our YouTube page. So uh, take a look at Epaphras. But there are a couple things about Epaphras I just want to remind you of. Okay, one, he was a Gentile. Okay, Paul makes a clear delineation right here. Those before this were Jews that have been fulfilled. Those that are after Gentiles that have been fulfilled. Okay, so uh, Epaphras. Now, um, oops. Sometimes I gotta wear these, and sometimes I gotta take them off, and sometimes I'm not sure which. Um, we believe that he was probably from the city of Laodicea. We believe that at some point he came to a saving faith, probably under Paul's ministry. We believe that after he came to faith, he probably established the churches at Laodicea and Colossae, and possibly was involved in the establishment of the church at Hierapolis. Okay? We know that at some point he left those places and joined Paul, 
and at this point was in Rome with Paul. Okay? Um, we read some of the stories of him through Acts and through some of the references that Paul makes of him in his epistles, and we understand that Epaphras knew what was going on. Epaphras had a heart to serve God in whatever capacity God would use him. Now, you would think that a man that had established churches would consider himself kind of a... Well, hello. I'm important. Don't you recognize me? I'm important. But that wasn't really the case with Epaphras because Epaphras set aside those things to follow Paul and to minister to Paul and whatever was needed. Okay? So take a look. If you want more information on Epaphras, go, go take a look at that, the previous message. Um, better yet, study it yourself. Get into God's Word and see what it has to say. So we have Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus. He greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those of Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Now, all three of these churches are in a very close proximity. Uh, these cities are in a very close proximity one to another. Okay? Um, now we move on to verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. Now Luke is an interesting character. Um, it is speculated that Luke actually came into an encounter with Paul because, now see what this says here? It says, Luke, the beloved physician. It's believed that, that Luke actually ministered to Paul when Paul was sick in Galatia. And that's how they came into contact with one another. Paul was sick, said, uh, we we're going to get you a doctor, and they brought this doctor named Luke who became a believer. And, and through Luke, now I'll tell you what, we don't actually hear a lot about Luke in the scriptures, but if you pay attention, you, you can kind of see Luke kind of pops up here and there. We see that in the book of Acts, uh, I believe it's six, chapter 16. Um, yeah, Acts 16. You don't, you don't have to turn there. You can look it up on your own. But we see in Luke chapter 16, all of a sudden Luke is a part of Paul's party. Because before verse 10, he, every time he's referring to Paul's party, he says they and them. But in verse 10, all of a sudden that changes to we and us. So we believe that at that point, Luke actually joined with the party of Paul. Okay? Now what's really cool about Luke is he's a physician. Okay? So he's a studied man. He's a learned man. He's a Gentile. He comes to uh, salvation. Again, we believe with the ministry of Paul. But, but he doesn't just stop there. Um, I mean, I, I think that's sufficient. I mean, he, he lays down his practice and goes out to minister. But Paul does something that really has blessed us directly because Paul is the, sorry, not Paul, Luke is the author of the Gospel of Luke as well as the Book of Acts, which really were, were two parts of one writing. Okay? We insert John in there. I'm not really sure why they did that, but you could tag right off of the last verse in Luke and go right into the first verse in Acts. Okay, and, and, and Luke penned that. Now, what's really interesting about this is Luke didn't just sit down and write it. You know, we have Matthew and we have John, who are eyewitnesses to the account, and we have um, Mark, who we re believe received what he wrote from Peter, who was an eyewitness to the account. <coughs> But Luke, he studied this. He went out and he interviewed people. He was like an investigative reporter, as they're supposed to be. And he went out and he talked to people. And he went and he, he checked things out and he, he made sure that, that all the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted. And he made sure that things were in order. Okay? And we see that this, from his writings, that, that Luke wasn't really writing from the perspective of a Jew. He's writing from the perspective of, of a Gentile. See, Matthew, Mark, and John are all from the perspective of Jews because they were written by Jews. But Luke was written by a Gentile. Okay? So Luke does some incredible things. 
Now I want to show you one, one thing we're going to move on. I'm going to try and get through this next person right here and then we'll stop for today. Uh, as does Demas. Now I'm going to back up. We say Tychicus, he's a beloved brother. Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Jesus, who is called Justice. These are my, the only men of the circumcision who are with me and they've been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas. You, you notice there's no description here. It just says, and Demas. Now, does anybody recognize the name Demas? Demas went away. Yeah. He abandoned the truth. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think Paul, I think this is proof of Paul writing under the inspiration of Scripture. Because at this point, Demas is still with Paul, but I think God's Spirit is illuminating something to Paul that comes about later. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, let's flip over to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. So I want to point something out to you. Now, last week we talked about some of the incredible examples of mercy and grace with Onesimus, the former slave. He had run away. And Paul was requiring of him that he make restitution. So he's going back to his master Philemon. Uh, we see John Mark, who went on the first missionary trip with Paul and Barnabas and bailed. He was fearful for his life, so he bailed and he ran home to mommy. And, but we see the restoration of these things. Because we see uh, church history tells us that Onesimus actually was, was given his manumission. He was set free by Philemon. We see that... John Mark uh, is referred to several times by Paul as someone that is useful to me, my beloved son in the Lord. We see that the restoration of relationship happened in those cases. But in, in uh, Demas' case, we see something quite different. And I, I think we need to take this as a warning. <coughs> Excuse me. So, 2 Timothy chapter 4, um, Paul is speaking to Timothy and he's speaking personally to him at this point. He says in verse 9, uh, chapter 4, verse 9, he says, Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. See, Demas bailed. Um, now, interesting how Paul phrases this. He says, um, in love with this present world. Now, I'm reminded when Jesus talks about the Pharisee and the sower of the seeds and the seed that fell among the, the weeds. You know, it grew up and it looked like the plant that it was supposed to be, but then the weeds grew up and choked it out and it died. And, and what Jesus says is the, the understanding of that part of the parable is that the, the cares and concerns of this life and the uh, pursuit of wealth. And I think that's Demas. I think he's caught up with the things that this life has to offer, and he's not understanding that what this life has to offer is temporary. And he's forsaken the call, he's forsaken the ministry, and he's run off to pursue other things. Now, I think that should be a warning to us, okay? Because you've got to remember in the parable of the sower of the seeds that some of the seeds fell on the ground, some fell in the rock, some fell in the weeds, and some fell in the good soil. So for every seed that fell in the good soil, there are three seeds that did not. Okay, we have to be very, very careful that the seed that God has planted in us is planted in good soil. We have to be cautious because we know that there's an enemy out there, which is interesting because Scripture describes him in two ways. Scripture describes him as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. Okay? You have an enemy that goes out there whose job is to strike fear into your heart and to separate you out from the herd, from the flock, and to devour you, to destroy you. But scripture also describes him in another way. Do you remember what the other way is? He appears as an angel of light. Okay? And, and that's something else we have to be cautious of. Um, the Bible reminds us that we need to be as shrewd as serpent, serpents and as innocent as doves. You know, when you come to faith, that doesn't mean you come to stupidity. 
Okay? Um, we're, we're not called to be stupid. As a matter of fact, we're called to be very wary. Okay? We have to have our, our eyes open to what's going on. Because there will be coming in to the church wolves with sheep's clothing. And we need to be quick to discern them. We need to be quick to protect the flock. We need to be very quick to guard what has been entrusted to us. Okay? So we have to be aware that the enemy is out there. He wants to put you in fear. He wants to destroy you. He also wants to deceive you. He also wants to pull you away. To make other things seem more important than what we've received at the cross. So we have to be cautious of these things, lest we fall as Demas fell. Okay? So I want to encourage you today. Be an unsung hero. Be an unsung hero. Because, you know, we look at these men and we don't see them very often. As a matter of fact, I, I took extra time to go over these men because I believe they're in here for a purpose. God inspired all of Scripture. And I think He put these men in here for a reason. And we need to pay attention to what that reason is. It's not by accident. It's not just like, oh, give my love to Aunt Sally. Okay? Uh, that, that may be what Paul was thinking when he put these things down, but God wasn't thinking that. God had more control than that. So why are they here? What does it say to us? I think it tells us that there is hope for us if we've stumbled, as Onesimus did, as John Mark did. There is work to be accomplished, as Tychicus and Epaphras and Aristarchus have done. And there is warning, as in Demas. Be cautious. Because once you come to salvation, that makes you a, 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 a target. Like Dennis and Jeannie always say, new level, new devil. New devil. All right? The, the, the further you go in the kingdom of God, the bigger that target gets on you. Okay? So we need to be cautious about things. We need to be shrewd and pay attention to those deceits that come amongst you. Anything that would turn you away, to turn your attention away from the things that God has for you. Amen? Amen. All right. Next week, I'm going to try and wrap this up. Now, I want to warn you. Month and a half, two months, three months, I don't know, sometime in the past, I told you guys to start looking up Scripture supporting the Trinity. I have not forgotten. A test is coming. A test is coming. Be prepared. Okay? Uh, my, my, my thinking at this point is that as soon as we wrap up Colossians, we are going to start a study on the essentials of our faith. Okay? So that everybody understands what we consider to be essential. Okay? And we want to focus on those things. Now, there's a lot of stuff in Scripture that is not essential unto salvation. Maybe essential to how you live out that salvation, but is not essential unto salvation. So we're going to be talking about that. So be prepared, okay? Um, we're going to be really putting out some ideas for you. We're going to be stretching your brains, because what I want you guys to be is prepared. So when somebody comes up to you and goes, oh yeah, why? You can go, oh yeah, because. <laughs> All right? Father,